Okay, welcome to Peeling Sid Barrett. This is episode 25, and in this episode I'd like to discuss the song Dark Globe. Now, Dark Globe is, of course, part of the title of Mr. Palacios's book, and he discusses a bit about the song, but he does, he does seem to recognize that there's something special about the song, and I think you'll agree after you've listened to it if you haven't heard it already. But, uh... Again, we're kind of assuming that we understand things about Mr. Barrett when we draw conclusions from his music. And of course, uh, some of those conclusions may be accurate, some may not be, but without him kind of validating things, we really don't know what he's trying to relay, if he is even trying to relay anything with the song. So uh, the first thing I'd like to discuss is that we've had some new people join up, and I do appreciate that. Thank you very much. It's always nice to see that other folks are possibly interested in the same thing and are considering the material as well. So uh, I do, I, I get a bit of, let's say, I get a little bit more of a push when I see that. So thank you for that. Uh, the other thing that I'd like to say about that is that when people join up, I, I don't know specifically what part of the channel they're signing up for. So. They might be joining up for paintings or music or discussions about Sid. I don't know which one. And all I can say is that I try to keep doing all of them. So please be patient, uh, especially making a new song is something that can just happen whenever. So if it doesn't happen every week, then um, please be patient. Uh, I'll keep doing each of them. So hopefully I get to what uh, uh, is rewarding for other people but also rewarding for me as time allows. Another thing that I'd like to kind of discuss is that uh, as most of you know at the beginning of each episode I like to discuss things like uh, corrections and thoughts on previous episodes so I'll go through that now and also I, I do a bit of this just kind of off the cuff and it's loose and I like it that way. I do write down my points that I'd like to kind of go through but I'm not writing out specifically what I want to say about each of them. So that can be a little bit, uh, let's say, it can feel a little bit disconnected or chaotic at times but um, that's how I kind of want it to be. So um, whether that's just because I'm lazy or if it's Possibly because I feel in a way that's more honest. I don't know. Maybe it's both. But uh, that's how I want to do it. And that's how I've been doing it. So hopefully that's not too much of a distraction for folks. Okay, so here's a few things and a few thoughts that I've forgotten to include or perhaps I should have discussed previously. Or things that I've noted. And I'll kind of throw up information on the screen there as we run through them. The first is that we did golden hair. And I forgot to mention other people um, also kind of being interested in the song and, and doing things with it. So one of the things, of course, we've mentioned Mr. Bobinski. I like his animation. He has done a golden hair video. I'll link it in the description. And if you like Mr. Bobinski and his animation, I'll suggest you check it out. He's pretty good. The other thing is that uh, Hope Sandoval who is from Mazzy Star, did a cover of Golden Hair, and I didn't know that until recently. She did it quite a while ago. And if you like uh, Hope Sandoval and Mazzy Star, and, and a lot of people know her and her music, and the guitarist for um, for Mazzy Star, and I, I can't remember his name. I'll throw it on the screen there. Uh, his band just before Mazzy Star was called Opal, and he was a fan of Sid Barrett. And uh, anyway, she has done a version of Golden Hair, and it's pretty good. I don't think it's her best stuff, but uh, of course, she, uh, with Mazzy Star, they did the song Fade Into You, which was kind of, I don't know. I, I don't want to call them a one-hit wonder because I actually like a lot of their songs, but that is the song most people know. And it's, I mean, it's, it's a really good song, but I do like a lot of songs off of that album specifically so uh, if you if you're into Pink Floyd uh, you might like Mazzy Star quite a bit at least that album 
Another thing that I'd like to discuss uh, that I, I mentioned previously, uh, the idea of doing loving in the winter, and this was just in the last uh, episode, episode 24, I believe, uh, this thought of what exactly was intended by the Jug Band Blues lyric, do loving in the winter, may have been a political statement, although uh, I wasn't then at that time ready to say, yeah, Mr. Barrett was politically motivated in any way. It seems like most of his material is just kind of personal. So, uh, <clears throat> one thing that I did kind of discuss in the Arnold Lane videos when we discussed uh, the nature of the band members laying around the feet of Mr. Barrett is that one possible explanation for that might be a comment on by on the painting Medusa um, and how uh, perhaps it lined up with the way people were kind of laying down. Now the Medusa uh, I, I found uh, a channel called Great Art Explained I believe and this person or this group of people breaks down they break down that that specific painting and they do mention a couple things that do incline towards very specific political discussion. Now, uh, if you're not interested in checking, I, I really recommend that you go check that out. I'll just say that, just so you understand the painting and you understand the history behind that painting. Uh, but if you're not, I'll just kind of throw a couple ideas at you really quickly. One is that uh, the Medusa was a shipwreck, of course, but it was caused by incompetence, and that incompetence was caused by political corruption, and that followed the French Republic and the reinstallation of an incompetent, monarchical regime that, again, began to promote people to positions they were not qualified for based on favoritism and relations. That's first. That's first bit. The second bit is that that... that occurrence was made even worse by uh, I guess you could call it kind of like a class warfare so a raft was kind of put together and eventually was being towed because it uh, wasn't able to uh, power itself and most of the I guess you could say the the lower ranking shipmates were put on that raft while the uh, upper ranking ones were in uh, boats and eventually I guess they just decided and they would cut the cut the ropes that were tying together and they would leave them so they were completely abandoned by their leadership so uh, if this is in your mind a representation that 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 specific portion of the song Arnold Lane and the way that they're lined up and if you think that may be a representation of the of the Medusa or the raft of the Medusa then we have to think that perhaps Mr. Barrett is considering political topics uh, within his music from time to time. So I'd just like to point that out. Now another thing that I'd like to point out is that uh, I previously mentioned that I didn't think that, and I, I did say please don't take this as unwarranted uh, or rude commentary, but a lot of Americans are not as versed in English literature as the English are in their schooling system and uh, what I did not mean by that is that Americans are uneducated in literature what I meant was that English people are more likely to be knowledgeable and educated on English and England specific literature and that Americans are very likely going to be more educated on American literature that is still English so when I said English I didn't mean English as a language, I meant English more as a as a nationality. Just to just to clear that up. So as an American, I am an American. I would wager that uh, most Americans recognize Edgar Allan Poe. I think most English folks would recognize the name Edgar Allan Poe as well. But we do spend a good amount of time on on uh, American poets and American writers and. And some schools even have uh, classes devoted to American literature. In the same way, uh, the English and the British, I suspect, spend quite a bit of time on English literature. That's all I was trying to say there. 
another bit is that I believe in clock in uh, Clockwork Orange in Apples and Oranges there is a lyric about a lorry driver, ma'am, and uh, just in reading over over things recently. Hopefully I can find where I read them, but, and I'll cite them here if I can, but I did read that Mr. David Gilmore and I believe Jimmy Page were working as lorry drivers for, for a while. And uh, in the song, Apples and Oranges, I'm the lorry driver, man. I don't know. I mean... I, I do wonder if is he referencing one of those two guys you know is he saying that he's going to be working with them or through them in some fashion I don't know uh, it's just such an oddly placed lyric in that song that it's bothered me for a really long time so and I did also see an interview with someone who was in a kind of a lower echelon band that never really broke out and he was discussing and I, I tried to find it last night and I couldn't find it but he was discussing how if, if anyone can find that and relay the information I'll throw it in the description later but um, he was relaying how he could he could talk with uh, Roger Sid Barrett but he couldn't really talk and relate to the other members of the band they were kind of standoffish for some reason and he kind of seemed to be implying that perhaps it was uh, tied to class or background or something like that, but I really really can't remember who that guy was so if you're aware of that then please kind of Let me know in the comments and I'll, I'll throw that in now <clears throat> uh, Another thing that I'd like to kind of mention really quick is that there in in the breakdown of saucer full of secrets there are a number of and we did that in our Did Sid kind of discussion. There are a number of Beatles references in there. And, and of course, making references to, uh, to other music and to other forms of uh, art is something that Mr. Barrett kind of did quite frequently. Not saying that uh, he, of course, did uh, Saucer Full of Secrets. Uh, I don't know. Maybe he did help out with it or something. I don't know. But... That is really odd to me, and I would just like to point out that um, I, I I do kind of wonder. I mean, the Beatles were keen to kind of help out with uh, handing out songs to some people, and of course, the Beatles had built this entire scene. You have to wonder how much of that band is investing in other bands kind of coming up and being up and coming so uh, this entire second wave of British bands obviously they were influenced by the Beatles but the Beatles also were interested in these other bands doing well and and giving studio time to other bands that's money that's money from the Beatles to help develop other other bands in some way it's it's an investment in a company it's an investment in what we would today call a brand so uh, how much of the Beatles is influencing other other bands I don't know I haven't really considered that I never thought of it to that degree until I went through saucer full of secrets and saw the various kind of Beatles um, thoughts and influences lining up in that album but that's just kind of an aside. Now, um, uh, I did find another interview that is of interest to me, in, in, anyway. And that is, it's kind of total, titled, Locked in a Room with Sid. And there are a few things that came up in that interview, uh, or discussion of an interview, really, is kind of what it is. And if you're interested in Mr. Barrett, then you might want to check that one out. But uh, one is that uh, he mentions in that that he feels like he can't really sing, which if you've heard his music, uh, 
I would say he doesn't have what most people consider to be a traditional amazing singing voice, but he does certainly have an aspect to his voice that's pretty, um, I would say, ethereal. It's, it's otherworldly, and it's uh, also quite compelling in so, some ways. In, in other words, he conveys certain emotions quite well, like sadness or perhaps a, a bit of um, desperation. Um, the, the other thing is kind of the idea that he was writing fairly regularly, or at least he references that he was writing fairly regularly in that in that interview and uh, there also is a, a, a Chris Welch interview that's kind of mentioned there and he mentions having a lot more material now the last thing kind of that's interesting I think about that being locked in a room with Sid is that they kind of briefly discuss that Mr. Barrett was quite paranoid at that at that exact moment in time. Now this is they're giving of course what they are experiencing and what they were experiencing at that time is they show up for the interview the managers are kinda of like Sid locked himself in his room he won't talk with anybody so they go there and they go talk with him for the interview and apparently he was convinced that uh, that there were people around that were aliens or something like that which sounds really odd to say it's a very odd thing to consider uh, I don't know really what's going on there with that. Some people believe, of course, that uh, he had a, a breakdown uh, or was perhaps prone to schizophrenic, um, I guess you could say, uh, kind of a schizophrenic episodes. I don't know. Like I said, I'm not, a, I'm not an expert. I'm not a trained in that field. And I'm not going to draw any conclusions like that because I don't know. But I will say that that's a pretty odd kind of an occurrence and if you are of the mind that Mr. Barrett kind of perhaps had to be removed or remove himself for reasons that tied in with mental wellness then there's an example you can point to and say well you know what's happening there of course it could have been manufactured just to kind of build up this this uh this kind of story about who he was but that's that's their story so take from that what you will I guess that's all I'll say and I guess that's pretty much all that I wanted to relay in the preamble to our discussion. So without further ado, I guess let's kind of look at the lyrics for Dark Globe. And one of the things that I'd like to point out is for this song, <clears throat> this was released in uh, 1970 on the Madcap Laughs album. And the strumming pattern on this guitar is a little bit odd. It is not uniform throughout the song. And people again will point to this and say that this is an indicator that Mr. Barrett didn't understand rhythm and wasn't capable of rhythm. And I will, um, in his defense, I suppose, say uh, Bob Dylan also had very irregular strumming patterns. And if there are two people I can think of that are driven by lyrics from that era, it's definitely Mr. Dillon and Mr. Barrett. So um, we can see the symptom and point to various causes of it, the symptom being irregular, uh, irregular rhythms. And we can subjectively kind of determine what we think might be the reason for it. But I'd just like to point out that one of the reasons for it could very well be that the song is completely structured around the rhythm of the words, and which includes the strumming of the guitar. And if you ever try to uh, put together a rhythm around the lyrics of a poem or something like that, you will, in my opinion, you will innately come to a rhythm on the guitar that fits with the words. Just not saying that's how he constructed the music, but I have I have felt that compulsion when I have gone through, and that's part of the reason why I wanted to set music to older forms of poetry was to get a feel for that. And for me, at least, it's very true. So perhaps that's what's going on. Uh, so anyway, I guess let's go ahead then and, and kind of jump into the song. 
and we'll note um, the various influences and perhaps some of the meanings that are being relayed in the song. Now eventually I'm going to do another Did Sid and I just want to point out that this song compared with or or tied to the next Did Sid and that's going to be Did Sid More. I want to cover that album or at least the soundtrack for that album and the aspects of the film. That's what kind of became my initial kind of aha moment where I thought that's very interesting there are connections happening here that uh, go beyond what I was expecting so and and of course I I really enjoyed more and as as a kid I liked more the album I didn't really understand what was going on with the film of course but I did enjoy the album and I've seen someone post something about more is the worst album per made by Pink Floyd and it kind of upsets me because it's not true in my opinion it's not true at all so uh, when I when I go through the the lyrics kind of for this song and then tie it with did Sid more I want to kind of convey that that feeling that there definitely is some very wonderful things happening within these within these two items so let's go through the lyrics and sorry I keep getting distracted but he asked the question uh, where is someone now and the first interesting word combination is pussy willow now uh, he's he mentions that that pussy willow smiled on this leaf so there he is again providing a metaphor comparing himself to a leaf We've seen him compare himself to uh, trees and other animate objects like animals before. Uh, this relationship specifically seems to be uh, to plants, so perhaps some form of platonic, platonic form of relationship, who knows. An idealized, I would say abstract, removed from animal impulses type of relationship. Uh, the idea that there's a pussy willow is interesting, of course, because the willow reference runs through Mr. Barrett's music. He uh, has made a previous correlation. We assume the earliest form of it I can find is, is within Emily Play. So if you want to see that discussion, go back and look at Peeling Sir Barrett, uh, see Emily Play. And the idea that it's tied to Ophelia in uh, Hamlet. So, Pussy Willow. Now, why a Pussy Willow? Well, small, of course, Pussy Willow isn't really a willow tree. It's uh, just a separate uh, plant. And, of course, it's known for being kind of uh, the buds having a little bit of velvet on the outside of them. Uh, I'm not sure exactly what he's intending there, but I just want to point out that that is very similar in wording. The idea of someone being a Pussy Willow is... There's a relationship here, and then there's the very specific and unique aspect of Pussy Willow that it is uh, kind of velvet on the buds. And of course, we previously mentioned the word combination Velvet Bride, which is in Julia Dream, which of course is supposedly not written by Mr. Barrett. But I just want to point out, that's a variation of it that seems to be conveying the same same form of feeling without the same words okay now the next line is uh, he says he was alone and this person whoever it is promised a stone from their heart which is absolutely beautiful I, I have to say the idea of someone promising a stone from their heart conveys the idea of course that they have a stone heart which is a bit crushing uh, but I just want to point out that uh, in traditional Western society, everyone promises with stones. We do it, of course, with uh, engagement rings. That's that's the indication. And you have to consider, of course, the permanence of stone, which is the point of a diamond ring, uh, that stones can be quite beautiful, but also that it's supposed to represent a form of promise from a person's heart. The next bit is about his head kissing the ground what entirely he means by that, I don't know. He can mean, of course, the ground is down, so perhaps he's depressed. Uh, perhaps he's fallen. Um, 
Why he mentions that it's kissing the ground, I don't know. Uh, I'll also go through and look for, uh, I guess, combinations that are poetic. And I just want to point out that so far, there hasn't been much rhyming, if you notice. Uh, there hasn't been clanging and there hasn't been a whole lot of rhyming. So, in a way, this is kind of a totally different method of writing. So, Mr. Barrett appears to be quite capable to write in ways that are distinctive from one another. Okay, so what does he mean by his head kissing the ground? I really don't know, but his head is down. Uh, of course, that could mean going to sleep. It could mean various things. We'll keep running through this. And of course, each one of these that we can't really figure out, you have to take in context. So if we find multiple references to the same idea, we can kind of assume logically that they're discussing the same thing. He mentions being half the way down and treading the sand. Okay, so... Uh, most people would say that they're treading water. So treading the sand uh, could kind of, it, it draws up the idea of perhaps not being stable, but also not being in water. Uh, perhaps treading the sand would be something that happens in quicksand. In other words, being pulled down. Uh, he mentions, please lift a hand. So... What he means by lift a hand there, I'm not entirely certain, but obviously it could mean simply, please help me, please give me a hand. Uh, the next bit seems to be um, agreeing with that, where he says, I'm only a person. These, this next bit, of course, is quite disturbing. He mentions that his armbands beat. Uh, why would his armbands be beating? And what does he mean by an armband? Uh, an armband could be a very disturbing idea. This is a song about apparently being down and needing help. And he's mentioning armbands. Okay. He mentions his hands then and they're hanging tall. So I don't know what he means by hanging tall, but... Uh, there seems to be a bit of detachment about his body. Um, and, then he, and then he asks the rhetorical question. A rhetorical perhaps, perhaps it's not. Uh, won't you miss me? And, and wouldn't you miss me at all? Very depressing and very sad to think about. Now, the next line is probably the most important line in understanding this song. The poppy bird's way. Okay, now he consistently uses the word way for some reason. Uh, I, I suppose it's kind of a beat thing, but uh, what he means by way kind of varies over time. But uh, the method, I guess you could say, or the lifestyle. Uh, what is a poppy bird? Well, of course, there is no poppy bird, but it could be him. He references birds when he's... <clears throat> when he has... Uh, been providing metaphors to himself. We've seen in the song Hoppy Bird, not Poppy Bird, the song Hoppy Bird. <laughs> Funny there, isn't that? That, uh, that he's referring to himself because he's a singer. So is he referring to himself as a poppy bird? And there may be our hint that this is actually a song about opiates because opiates come from poppies, which would explain the reference to the armband previously and the disassociation from body, and also the idea that he is down on the ground and unable to lift his hand. Now, we all like to think that each, uh, each generation's experience with the absolutely debilitating effects of opiates is something that is new, but it is not, and it has been happening for thousands of years. So, uh, I would just like to point out that it's a, it's quite a, it's an incredibly addictive drug. And so he may be discussing that. So is he talking about himself? Well, the next, the next line is incredibly interesting. Swing twigs and coffee brands around. What does he mean by swinging twigs? Well, he just referred to a bird. So perhaps he's discussing twigs. Uh, I don't know entirely what swinging twigs, a twig of course has a certain, 
kind of a feel to it. Uh, and the clue or the cue could be the next bit where he says coffee brands around. And I actually think that line could be coffee grounds around. And the reason for that is because Mr. Barrett did a number of works of art with coffee grounds. So swinging twigs and coffee grounds could be a reference to making art. And of course, swinging twigs would be something like a paintbrush. Uh, then he mentions brandishing a wand with a feathery tongue. Very interesting combination of words there. Uh, we just mentioned swinging twigs. Uh, now I'm trying to just kind of understand this in the context of Mr. Barrett's life. There are, of course, different reasons why someone would be swinging twigs, coffee brands around. Hmm. I do also wonder if this isn't some kind of a fight where someone's swinging twigs or swinging their arms, perhaps, and coffee brands are being flung around or someone's throwing coffee in all around. And then a brandish of her wand. So there is a reference there to who actually is the object of the song. It's a her. And what is meant by brandishing a wand, I don't know. And a feathery tongue. Now when people brandish things with their tongue, of course that can be a reference simply to them uh, um, speaking things in certain ways. So a feathery tongue could be a very complimentary type of a tongue in the same way that uh, uh, the Bible kind of calls out the idea of someone having a sword in their mouth, uh, which is very likely a metaphor for someone speaking war, words of war, uh, in my opinion. Anyway, a possible reading of that would be that. So he may be kind of utilizing a same idea there. And we've, we've previously mentioned uh, possible uh, religious connections to Mr. Barrett with various philosophies and world religions. I just like to, as an aside, say, please don't take that as me saying that I approve of certain things and I don't approve of certain things. I very much approve of the idea of people reflecting upon themselves, and I think you can get that in very many ways, provided that's a, a positive experience that, that's built upon the development of the individual. I think it's very good, and it's not built upon the deliberate breaking down of the individual. Okay, so <clears throat> there is another possibility, of course, that that could be a sexual reference, brandishing a wand with her feathery tongue. <clears throat> uh, he mentions his head again being being uh, his head kissing the ground he's half the way down uh, please lift a hand and then he mentions again that he's only a person and the next bit uh, which is that uh, with an Eskimo chain he tattooed his brain all the way now that's the last bit uh, that kind of is a Barrett Mentioning, of course, this could be a reference to Iggy the Eskimo. And I don't know how she got that nickname. She was not Inuit. She was not Native American. My understanding is that she was a part uh, Pakistani or part Indian from India. I, I can't remember which. And I, I don't know necessarily that it matters. The, the thing that matters, well, there's two. One is, why do people feel that it's appropriate for them to be giving... Um, racial nicknames or cultural nicknames to other people. I'm assuming that she didn't call herself Iggy the Eskimo. Uh, I don't know, but this was a different time, of course. This was uh, in the late 60s and early 70s, and it could have possibly been given in a feeling of camaraderie. It m might not have been derogatory in the minds of the people that did it. I think, of course, now things are quite different, so Certainly that wouldn't have been acceptable now to uh, separate someone in this way, even if it's just uh, perhaps done in a friendly form of a way, you're still separating that person and generating an, uh, an untrue narrative about a person. So, uh, so that's my thoughts anyway. Uh, of course, he was with Iggy for a bit and uh, the reference to chain. So, uh, 
the idea there that she's a chain of some form, I just want to point out, could also be pointing to the idea that she's his tether or his tie to something, to reality perhaps, or to the world, or to something. And he mentions that he tattooed his brain all the way. Now what's meant, to, what's meant by tattooed, I don't know. Uh, of course, uh, Mr. Eddie Vedder also used this idea in the song Black uh, when he mentions that everything is tattooed, which in a way means everything is black because tattoos are usually dark. So uh, now, of course, they use a lot more colors now and whatnot, but uh, it used to be that almost all tattoos were that really dark kind of blue or black color that faded to blue over time. So he could be saying that his brain was damaged all the way, which could mean that she's his tether because he's abusing various substances. This may be an admission to Mr. Barrett stating that uh, he may have had a drug habit of, cert of a certain kind. He may have been quite addicted to opiates and uh, other, other drugs as well. And this may be an admission of sorts, or at least the relation of a recognition that he had damaged himself in some way through their use. And the idea of having this chain that's Iggy would be tied to the idea of her watching over him while he's kind of having these lost weekends uh, or, or utilizing these substances. So they're supposed to make sure that this person doesn't get hurt in any way doesn't do anything that's too nutty and just kind of be their caretaker while they're doing these things because uh, people around them have either decided that they can't control it or he doesn't want to control it and so they're just going to try to minimize negative impacts and if you've uh, ever been around people that are abusing substances or ever been a uh, I guess you could say uh, family relation to someone like this. This is a really touchy topic because um, it's it's very difficult to manage. So one of the things that traditionally people have done is they're in the same way that when people go to clubs and there's a, there's a uh, person that's going to be doing the driving, that person is supposed to abstain from use and uh, other people can do what they like, but that person essentially becomes the mother or the caretaker or the sober driver, the sober one that is supposed to make sure that there are no problems that happen. And he, Mr. Barrett may be relaying that uh, his chain failed or that perhaps Iggy wasn't um, aware of what was happening or maybe she, he thought that she would do something, I don't know. It is also possible, of course, that uh, someone who's of this lifestyle, uh, in a way, if he was trying to impress Iggy, he may have gone way overboard. I don't know. And Rick Wright is on record as saying there was kind of a lost weekend where Sid Barrett came back very changed. He may be referencing that occurrence here. I don't know. This is much later, and I believe he was hanging out with Iggy much later than 67. So... Uh, that would perhaps be a, a rebuttal that Rick Wright is talking about it in 67. And I believe that uh, Mr. Barrett wasn't hanging out with uh, Iggy until like 69 or so. I could be wrong, but that would be much later. So if he's referencing that event, you have to assume that he's in, he's kind of, he's, he's giving the idea that this didn't happen until much later. So, um, that's kind of the reading of that song that I'd, I'd like to give. Now, there is one other thing that I'd kind of like to point out. Uh, if you learn guitar, if you mess with this song, and I, I haven't really messed with the song, I might mess with it later and, and do something with it, I don't know. But it is striking to me that he uses quite common chords in a lot of these songs, but he seems to consistently come up with a very odd chord to throw in to give a bit of a... I guess you could say a strange kind of a sensation or feeling for each song. So in Terrapin, he, he definitely does that. He throws in a very odd chord on the fifth fret. 
And uh, I'm not going to go into that too much because most folks don't know what I'm talking about. But if you are into guitar, you'll see that Mr. Barrett has a tendency to use very, very simple chords. And then he will use um, a, an odd chord from time to time. And it throws off the song a bit. And sounds pretty good to me anyway. So um, that's pretty much it for the song itself. Now, I, I would like to kind of give a, a few items from, uh, or some ideas, that, uh, and some context like we usually do. So we discussed our work element. Now let's give some background and some other things to think about that might be tied to it. Now, um, on page 389 of Rob Chapman's book is a mention of Rosemary discussing the, the mild paranoia that Mr. Barrett, or potentially mild paranoia that Mr. Barrett sometimes displayed, and his bewilderment really that with people that they were interested in him at all and why. So you have to put yourself in his shoes now. It is a pretty strange thing to have people kind of just show up and want to be around you, want to talk to you, etc. That's kind of odd. For years, for, for many, many years, people were kind of doing that. I certainly understand it. I certainly would have liked to have met Mr. Barrett. Um, but, you know, why would Mr. Barrett want to meet me? That's, that's a really tough question. And I don't think that uh, most people recognize the, the implication of the question of why would someone want to meet you? They don't know you. They don't know me. Uh, so there are people that we meet during the course of our lives that are very important to us, and that usually comes through shared experience. But the idea, as, as we're doing here, we're interpreting Mr. Barrett's music, and he's creatively relaying things that are or are not directly tied to his own life, can give one the feeling, of course, that you know things about that person. And, of course, some people will feel that they are attached to that person in a way. And I won't say that they are or they are not. Certainly having someone's music or art impact you is uh, a connection to a person in a way. But it's extremely distant. And so to the person that's creating things, I think... Um, it can be unnerving to have people kind of just feel that or assume that that there's a connection there that um, it's a, it's intended as a as a, in a way it's it's intended because you want people to connect with what you're making but that doesn't mean that they're connected with you just my opinion uh, on page 371 Rosemary again relays the idea of people being obsessed with him and, of course, ladies that thought that they were going to save him and have this wonderful relationship with him, etc. And I would just like to point out that that's a very logical thing to think. If you've gone through the lyrics of these songs that Mr. Barrett made as a solo artist, a number of them are dealing with the idea of being brokenhearted, depressed, lost, and needing help. And they often point to a female or females in his life that uh, he's dependent upon. And so any person who wanted to have that type of relationship would look at that and say, well, I can fix that. That's, I'm not going to say that's illogical. What is illogical is that, <clears throat> and I, I would like to kind of point this out as being a, perhaps a larger issue. And I'll get to why this is an issue later. But uh, what is illogical is, again, there's no shared experience. There's no mutual unique uniquity that's occurring there. And what Mr. Barrett is relaying, of course, or possibly relaying, we have to assume he's not just simply writing songs that are perhaps brokenhearted songs because brokenhearted songs do well. Or because he was only perhaps driven to write creatively when he was feeling that sensation. It doesn't mean he was always feeling that way. We assume that, of course, but and perhaps there's some logic to that assumption. But it may be that uh, he simply had a voice 
that was quite tied to the idea of grief and loss. Perhaps he recognized that, he, so he expressed it more. He did make some very funny songs, and we'll get into some of those later. But uh, so far, I mean, you can tell that a lot of these are dealing with the idea of relationships and a sensation of loss. So, <clears throat> um, I, I just want to point out kind of the idea of, there. Are, I'm going to throw kind of three books at you. One is called Eros and Civilization, and that's by... Um, uh, it's a philosophical inquiry into Freud by Herbert and Marcuse. I believe that's how you pronounce his name or her name. I'm not sure. Uh, Civilization and its Discontents by Sigmund Freud. And uh, Madness and Civilization, A History of Insanity in the Age of Reason by uh, Michael Foucault or Michel Foucault. I, I'm not exactly sure how to pronounce their name. So these kind of books tie in with the idea that that the nature of civilization currently can be quite uh, disconcerting to a number of people and its impacts on the individual are often not understood by the average person. So one of the things that happens within a society is of course that a person realizes that they are surrounded by other people. That recognition is an attack upon individuality almost immediately. It can be quite debilitating and so uh, quite often people will come to the realization that they are valueless because there are so many other people. And of course, there are sayings that back this up. Like if you have a breakup, people will say, well, there's a lot of other fish in the sea. It's true. There are a lot of other fish in the sea, but they're not the same fish. So <clears throat> when Mr. Barrett's relaying these ideas, of course, if he was totally tied into the idea of being unique, Every person that you meet is unique, and every person that you meet has an intrinsic value tied to them uh, that's completely uh, distinct from their background or what other people might think that their worth is. And so his relationships with certain people, and we'll assume ladies because usually he is singing about her, uh, those relationships are totally unique to him. And of course, he'll tie them in with who he is as a person as well at that time. So uh, that uniqueness is kind of a mutual uniqueness. It's a recognition that not only the person that you're with is unique, but also that you are unique. And a lot of people seem to assume that that is something that can be replaced. But the truth is it can never be replaced. Eventually, people can move on to other forms of unique relationships and unique experiences and unique expressions of self but to actually capture or recapture that time that is a unique time with a unique person and a unique expression of yourself is is impossible it can't be done so perhaps that's why Mr. Barrett is bewildered and Rosemary also are a bit bewildered at the idea that people think that they're just going to come and and uh, immediately be able to fill a, fill a hole or a loss or uh, a broken heart or be able to heal a broken heart in Mr. Barrett because that's tied to unique things in him. Okay, so uh, <clears throat> I haven't read through those three books. Uh, I've read parts of each of them. I have a tendency to skip around um, a lot. So... I'll apologize and I'll tell you that I'm not going to recommend them because I don't know them well enough to feel that I can recommend them. And these book ideas came from various um, influences and I, I'll suggest that most of those probably came from Mr. Palacios's Dark Globe and Mr. Chapman's book, A Very Irregular Head. I just kind of make notes as I, reading, as I read through things on some of the influences that they call out, and I try to read through them as I go. Okay, now the last item, sorry, this one's kind of going a little bit long, is that there, <clears throat> the idea of relaying uh, personal experience and also recognizing, recognizing the value of self and the value of your dream and perhaps being dedicated to that 
is something that is tackled by an, um, a German American author uh, and poet named Charles Bukowski. And if you're not familiar with Mr. Bukowski, I'll say that's um, that's too bad. Uh, he does have some wonderful things that he's written. I like him very much, of course. Um, liking things like creative writing is a very subjective kind of judgment. So uh, some things can be wonderful and a person may not like them at all simply because they don't connect to them. So I'm going to link a few things uh, from Mr. Bukowski. There are some pretty cool videos that people have put together. One is, your life is your life. There is a video uh, about Don't Try that's put together by Pursuit of Wonder. And uh, he mentions uh, Go All the Way. So Your Life is Your Life and Go All the Way are, I believe, two poems that Mr. Bukowski has put together. And basically he's kind of, in my opinion, relaying the idea that uh, each person's life is unique, that you should recognize what is truly, truly important to you and dedicate time to it as you can to to express what you need to express um, in this lifetime and to not let things kind of distract you from it and bring you down. Uh, he mentions that it's difficult to really know the true meaning of things and uh, and that creative endeavors often are <sighs> I guess a bit chaotic, I, I guess you could say, that creative endeavors can be quite chaotic and they're not necessarily f going to follow a formula the way that most people would like. But that a person should be willing to kind of go it alone sometimes in certain ways. And even if that's late at night putting together, you know, discussions about videos and discussions about um, the impact of Mr. Barrett and his music, then go ahead and do it, you know, just, uh, apply yourself to it. And um, I think Mr. Bukowski perhaps um, suffers from, and I've told you before that I was a teacher. So, so one of the things that I've noticed that some teachers do is they have a tendency to start to believe themselves. And they don't are unwilling to recognize or admit that they've made mistakes. I make mistakes all the time. I've made mistakes in previous videos. I, I want to be able to make mistakes and I, I'm going to. And I'll call, try and call them out if people mention them. Now, Mr. Bukowski's mistake might be that he eventually made it. And not all people follow a dream or an idea and make it. In a way, he was very lucky. And I'm not sure he recognized that at the end there. So just as an example, uh, Mr. Kafka, Franz Kafka, never made it, was never recognized. He was a genius and he was completely unrecognized in his lifetime. And in fact, he, I believe, attempted to burn some of his work. Uh, Van Gogh was only beginning to be recognized as the genius that he was before his death. Many, many people will struggle through life and are never recognized. And you have to ask yourself sometimes if there isn't just some dumb luck that's associated with actually getting through. And people can struggle their entire lives to try and attain a dream and never attain them. And in a way, Mr. Bukowski discusses that this is something that makes it still valuable, that the struggle itself is the point, and perhaps that that struggle is something that builds us up and gives us strength and makes us wonderfully unique. The last thing that I'll provide a link to is, is uh, perhaps his most famous uh, poem, which is called Bluebird. And uh, I'll suggest you check that out as well. So uh, that's pretty much it for Dark Globe. Uh, this was a little bit longer than I thought it was going to be, but uh, I, I Looking back on it, I can't say that there's anything really that I'd like to remove. So hopefully it was worthwhile. Hopefully you enjoyed the video. If you're new uh, and you want to make comments, please feel free to do so. If you haven't subscribed and turned on notifications and given a like, then I'll ask that you please do that as well. 
As I mentioned, I'm going to try and do a Did Sid episode on more next, and then I think I'm going to evaluate a painting or a, a group of paintings. So uh, I'll talk to you soon. Take care.